I'd like to introduce Chad Pritchard, Dr. Chad Pritchard, who is the chair of Eastern's geology department, and he's going to welcome you to uh, our awesome webinar with uh, Dr. Scott Burns. Yeah, thanks, Nigel. Um, and thank you for joining us here and, and joining Eastern Washington University Department of Geology and the Columbia Basin Geologic Society tonight. Um, it's such an amorphous time, but we hope I, we can share a positive experience amidst all this whirlwind around us. Um, and we hope that Zoom will be a great platform um, to get even more people to participate in lecture series this year. Tonight's talk is the first kickoff um, for a monthly lecture series that we'll have, ranging from geology of wine to tectonics in the Pacific Northwest to even spatter cones on Mars. Um, I am really excited about tonight's speaker though and this webinar, um, but real quick, I do wanna say feel free to post questions in the Q&A button at the bottom. If you scroll to the bottom of your screen, you'll have a Q um, ampersand A. You can click on that and type in a question and Nigel um, from Eastern will be sort of monitoring those questions. And then hopefully at the end too, if you have questions, you could raise your hand, but it's a webinar, so we can't see you. So the way that you would wanna raise your hand here is by clicking down on participants in the very bottom. And if you click on that, you can see raise your hand um, or raise your hand right there. And then we can see you and we can unmute you and call your name and you'll get a little prompt to, un to unmute yourself. Um, and, and that should work pretty well. Again, this is our first lecture of the series, starting off really great with Dr. Scott Burns. Um, but if there's a little bit of a, snafu there, um, we'll work through it. It'll be a good time. Um, I really appreciate having this conversation at the very end, making this live, the live webinar even more worth it, a little bit more real life. Um, yeah, so without further ado, um, the one, the only, the world famous geotoc technical soils expert, a landslide predicting guru and author of environmental, groundwater and engineering geology, not just geology. Um, as well as the book in the mega floods that he's speaking about tonight, Cataclysms in the Columbia, or on the Columbia. Dr. Scott Burns is an emeritus faculty at Portland State University, though I think every time I see him at meetings, he's got even more grad students, so I'm not sure what his wife's thinking about that. Um, Scott's taught all around the world, like he mentioned a little bit, from New Zealand to Colorado, and he's been a president of about every professional geologic society that I've heard of. Uh, most recently, he is the president of the International Association of Engineering Geologists. And as a PSU alumni, geology department alumni, I'm just absolutely humbled by Scott's kindness, his excitement about geology, and he even has wonderful kids. His children are perfect. He's got a whole family of wonderful people. Um, and I'm so proud to have tonight's speaker, Dr. Scott Burns, speaking about cataclysms on the Columbia, the Missoula floods. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Chad, for that introduction. And a special reaching out to you and everybody in Eastern Washington and in the Spokane area, one of my favorite places in the state of Washington. Uh, I just have to brag a little bit about Chad, too, because he was a star student of mine at Portland State, uh, and as was his wife, May. And so I, I love both of them. The other thing that you probably don't realize is that uh, Chad uh, is a great drummer. And he, my son is a punk rock guy and has a punk rock band. And Chad was the star drummer in one of my son Doug's bands. And in fact, they had a reunion of that band just a few years ago and he came back to Portland. Man, he can still play the drums. And Scott and, showed up at midnight to watch it. It was awesome. <laughs> so, so absolutely lots of fun. So tonight what we're gonna be doing is talking a little bit about the Missoula floods. All of you guys in the, in the Spokane area live right in the middle of where all these great floods came through. And I've got two stories to tell tonight. First of all, how science works and it doesn't work. And the story of how the, these uh, floods got uh, into the scientific literature and, and the struggles along the way. And Jay Harlan Bretz was very, very important in doing this. And the second one, is taking you from Glacial Lake Missoula all the way out to the coast and out onto the Astoria Fan and showing what the floods look like in that area. I got into this, well, I've been doing research uh, on the Missoula floods for the last 30 years. Um, and, it, and one of my mentors at Portland State was a guy named John Elliott Allen. And he and Marjorie Burns wrote the very first book publicizing uh, the Missoula floods. And it was called Cataclysms on the Columbia. Uh, and uh, John died in 1997. Marjorie was an English professor, and so she couldn't rewrite the book. 
And since I was doing research, and since all three of us were native Oregonians, we all uh, were professors at Portland State, I rewrote the book and it came out to what we have today, um, Cataclysms on the Columbia, the Great uh, Missoula Floods. One of the th three or four major books on the Missoula Floods. Uh, it was published by Ooligan Press, which is a graduate program at Portland State in publishing. And so we had graduate students continuously um, correcting our mistakes as we were rewriting them. And uh, so I dedicated this to John. I should have put my name as the first author, but then he was my mentor. And I said, nah, I don't need any more publications. And so I just left the order that way. So the, the initial star was a guy named Jay Harlan Bretz. He was a professor for a short period of time at the University of Washington. And in the summertime, he would take his graduate students at Eastern Washington to study uh, the uh, geomorphology that he was finding out th in that particular area. He had a wee bit of a ego. Uh, here's a photo of him uh, taken in front of Mount Rushmore. He says, five great men in one photo and four of them don't show. And it was Mount Rushmore. Also, look at his name, J. Harlan Bress. There's no period behind the J. The reason is J stands for nothing. He grew up in Michigan, and he grew up on a farm, and he was known as Harley Bretz. And then when he got to college, Albion College in Michigan, uh, he said, oh, Harley Bretz is not a dignified name. I'm going to go by my given name, Harlan Bretz, from now on. Uh, and then when he handed in his PhD dissertation, it, uh, it said J. Harlan Bretz. And his advisor said, what's this J standing for? And he said, Harlan Bretz is just not dignified the name for a PhD, and from now on, I'm gonna go by J. Harlan Bretz. And the professor said, what's the J stand for? And he said, nothing, it just sounds good. And so that is the, the guy that put this together. Now, in this particular talk, in case you fall asleep, I'm gonna show you the final slide. Uh, and, and so uh, you can see right here in Spokane, where most of you are from, um, it is where the great floods came down. So this was back at the end of the last glacial period. The continental glaciers coming down from Canada, they should go all the way across the eastern side there. Um, they were, were getting smaller and smaller, except one lobe that went down that northern part of Idaho, the Ponderay Valley, uh, it grew until it, it dammed up the major river that we call the Clark Fork River today that was draining all of eastern Montana. So the melting of the glaciers, all that water had no place to go. And the, the dam got to be 1,700 feet high and the, created a lake all the way back to Missoula, which we call Glacial Lake Missoula. And then eventually what happened that the, the water went over the top of the dam, broke up the front of the dam, and catastrophically drained in three days. All of that water went down through Spokane, through the Drummeller Scablands, and all across eastern uh, Washington, creating the channeled Scablands. And then all of that water went back into uh, the, the Columbia River um, and entered into the, um, the Columbia at Wallula Gap, and then down through the Columbia Gorge, and then it came to Portland, and then some of it went out into the ocean, some of it uh, went, filled up the Willamette Valley and then went out to the ocean later on. And then what happened is the dam reformed, the lake reformed, and we had the same scenario. And we had 40 floods that made it all the way to the Little Gap, 89 floods, uh, even more than that maybe, that made it down to Spokane. The first one being the biggest one because the ice was getting smaller and smaller and smaller uh, that we have got up there. So each flood kept getting a little bit less. So that's the story of the Missoula floods. Uh, and so here's a picture of J. Harlan Bretz in 1910, young geologist out there, already lost his hair. Uh, and then his USGS uh, field vehicle that he took out in the field, his standard graduate students, just like Chad has got at Eastern Washington out there and, uh, doing plain table and allidade mapping of that whole area. Uh, and, but as he, he was doing studies in Eastern Washington, he kept on seeing these huge valleys with no water in them. And it, Mother Nature was shouting out to him, there must have been a huge flood here uh, in the past. And then you go over to Dry Falls in the Grand Coulee, and it sure looked like a huge, huge Niagara Falls, many, many times the size. Uh, here is Dee Molinar's recreation of that. He, he was a uh, artist, or a geologist who was an artist, 
And it looked probably something like that. And then along some of the rivers, you would find these huge gravel bars. Look at the size of this grain uh, silos down here and the size of this gravel bar. That could not be created by a, a normal flood on the Columbia today. Or you go over to the, the uh, West Bar, which is just outside of Wenatchee, Washington, and you can see this gigantic uh, gravel bar that is there. Now, it, you can see the, these are waves, and you can go, go uh, and, and you can go to the top of one of the waves, uh, or the, the top of one of the uh, ripples, and then go to another one, and you can get a lambda a wavelength, and we can put this in the calculations like Vic Baker did, back calculate and get velocities, knowing the size of the particles and the, the size of the ripples. And Vic Baker, back in the early 70s, calculated velocities up to 60 miles an hour. The, the fastest velocity ever recorded in modern history for a flood is only 25 miles an hour. And so we're talking about huge, humongous uh, floods in the past. And then all over Eastern Washington and a lot of these coolies, uh, you'll find incredible erosion all the way down to the Columbia River basalt bottom, but you'll have islands of the Palouse Luss, the windblown silt that is found all over uh, eastern Washington, scouring down to those areas. Here is another area down, uh, um, right next to the Luss areas, you can see the smooth areas up, the windblown silt up above, but everything scoured uh, in this particular coulee here. And then there are these little lakes, we call them coke lakes. They are created by little tornadoes at high velocities. Uh, boring right down into the bedrock. And so all over eastern Washington, you have the Luss upper uh, uplands and then the coulees and scablands down below with Coke Lakes. You go down into the Columbia River Valley. This is just, uh, I took this right next to I-84. Columbia River is uh, right out in front. And then we're looking into Washington. So this is from the Oregon side. Uh, and you look up and you see Columbia River basalt, uh, eroded here, that, and then you have the Luss uh, up here that is exposed. The flood waters got this high. Normal floods, even the biggest floods on the Columbia River only get to maybe this white line down below. And so we're talking about huge floods. So Brett saw all of these uh, features all over Eastern Washington and in 1923, he published a paper. He called it the Spokane floods. He said that it looked like there was a huge flood coming down through Spokane, creating the Channel Scablands in eastern Washington, all that water going through Wallula Gap and down into the Columbia River. And he published a couple of uh, articles uh, along those lines. Uh, but uh, back in 1927, at the Geological Society of America meeting in Washington, D.C., they invited him to come back and talk about his Spokane flood, one flood. Uh, they didn't tell him that they had lined up other, five other speakers in a row after him, all hydrologists, all with the U.S. Geological Survey, to tell him how wrong they were. O.E. Meinzer on the left-hand side, the father of American hydrology, James Galuli. He's the guy that wrote the textbook that I learned geology on at Stanford many years ago. G.R. Mansfield, W.C. Alden, and E.T. McKnight. All of these guys said that, Brett, you're wrong. Where did the water come from? You don't have any source. And secondly, you're breaking one of the fundamental laws of geology, which is called uniformitarianism. That is all the landscapes of the world are created very slowly over a long period of time, not catastrophically, and this is catastrophic. And, and so by this time, Brett's had moved to the University of Chicago. And, and he's, he just quit doing research on this uh, area. Um, and because he just he was really humbled here in this thing. And he went into studying caves and cave formation uh, in the Midwest, primarily in uh, Arkansas and uh, in Missouri. But the onslaught continued all the way through the 20s and the 30s. Ira Allison on the left-hand side, uh, we will show, he mapped, uh, map the ice rapid erratics. I'll show you and talk about those coming up in a second. He was a professor at Oregon State. He said, no, Brett, you're wrong. Uh, there, uh, and he had uh, alternative uh, hypotheses. But the guy who really hated Brett was Richard Foster Flint. Richard Foster Flint is the father of American glacial geology and the father of American glaciology, a professor at Yale. And he, he actually went out um, uh, to the Channel Scablands, and he would not believe the stories. Uh, and, uh, and, and so when I rewrote the book, I found these pictures of these guys. 
And my co-author Marjorie Burns came in and she said, this is my favorite picture in the book. And I said, Richard Foster Flynn? And she said, yeah. And I said, it's just, uh, and she said, you have to realize that I'm a Dickens novelist specialist. And then every one of Dickens novels, there was a slimy, greasy, evil demon guy. Uh, and look at this slick back hair. He looks exactly like the, the, uh, the Uriah Heap of the story of the Missoula floods. And she said, this is my favorite uh, photo in the book. And, but the onslaught continued until 1940. And a guy who had been working for the U.S. Geological Service up in Montana most of his life and most of his career, J.T. Pardee, retired. All of those guys that destroyed Bretts back in 1927 um, were his bosses. He couldn't come out and talk against them. He was at that 1927 uh, lecture in Washington, D.C. He turned to the guy next to him, Kurt Bryant, and he said, I know where the water came from, but I am not going to tell anybody until I retire. And he retired. And so in 1940, at the American uh, Association for the Advancement of Science meetings in Seattle, Washington, uh, he had retired and he went up and he gave a talk. And in it, he said, you know, I've been working in, uh, up in Montana and up in the Markle Pass area, which it, uh, is between Glacial Lake Missoula and Spokane. And, and where the dam was in, in Ponderay Valley, I see all of these incredible ripples, uh, five and six miles long, 50 feet high, one after another, another. It looks as if a gigantic flood came through this air, area. And it, but he left it at that. He didn't put, he said, I published a paper on Glacial Lake Missoula back in 1910. And Brett talks about the floods over in Spokane. You put it together. He didn't come out. But then two years later, he did. He wrote a paper called The Rapid Emptying of Glacial Lake Missoula and its Unusual Currents. And then everybody said, whoa, there's the source of the water for Brett's Spokane flood. Uh, and they started believing. And more and more people all the way through the 40s and into the 50s uh, and uh, accept Richard Foster Flynn. Eventually, what happened was Brett's lived to be in 98 years old, in 1981, he passed away. And by that time, it was into all of the textbooks. And James Galuli actually put it in the, the textbook that I learned, Geology in the 1960s. And he, he was totally vindicated. He outlived all the detractors, including that evil villain, uh, Richard Foster Flynn. Uh, and in the end, won out. Now, that's not the end of the story when uh, he died. And there have been a lot of other authors uh, since that time and researchers, and, the, and we're continuing doing this today. One of the main guys is Vic Baker. Uh, uh, and Vic uh, is a professor at the University of uh, Arizona. He and I did our PhDs at the University of Colorado many years ago, back in the 70s. And he is the guy that, first of all, mathematically studied the Missoula floods, uh, and, and put all of the numbers and the velocities and the power functions and everything together. Here he is at Brett's house uh, in um, Chicago. Uh, and also at that same time, some of the first photos were coming back from Mars. And Vic took a look at it. He said, these are the same features I see in Eastern Washington, huge floods. And he also hypothesized huge floods on Mars many millions of years ago. Uh, and, and so by putting these features together. Uh, and he still continues to do research in this particular area, one of the leading guys. Another guy uh, who lives in Washington, in Vancouver, Washington, works for the U.S. Geological Survey, is Richard Waite. And Richard had an ooh-ah moment, and Chad knows about this. You know, when you're out in the field and all of a sudden two and two come together, and you, whoa, yes. And he, he was having lunch in, in Eastern Washington. Now, I have, in order to explain what we're talking about, I gotta go back to Geology 101. If you have a huge flood and the flood water stop, uh, and the water stops, and what happens is the, uh, all of the sediment in the water will all drop out. The largest particles will be at the bottom, the finest at the top, and if it's primarily sand, it'll be coarse grain sand, fine grain sand, silt. Coarse grain sand, fine grain sand, silt. He was, Richard was having lunch outside of Burlingame Gulch, which is just outside of Tushy, Washington. And uh, an irrigation canal had broken 
uh, in uh, previous years, and they cut this into the sediment that was up there. And he saw, look at all these different layers, biggest ones at the bottom, finest ones at the top. And so he went down and looked at one, and at the bottom you can see ripple marks with water going from the left to the right. Um, and sorry, I'm, I'm giving you a lecture right now. Um, and then, um, and, and so uh, you have a movement from left to right. Uh, and then um, uh, up towards the top, he saw layers of white. And when geologists are out in the field, especially in Eastern Washington or in Washington and Oregon, we see white layers, we think volcanic ash, a volcano's gone off. And we can sample these things, send them off to the lab at Washington State University, they'll zap it and they'll say, oh, that is the Mount St. Helens S ash, and give us a date on that. And he found that. And so what he did is he went back to this and counted all these up. He said 40 different layers. And he said, whoa, up until this point, Vic Baker and I are just saying maybe one, two, three Missoula floods. Um, and then uh, maybe we had more. Maybe we had 40 of them. Uh, and, uh, and over the period of time, he did dating of all of the, he would find uh, organic sediments and all of this. And he, uh, I'll show you the uh, dates coming up in a little while. Uh, and so he was very excited, and in 1982, 83, he published a paper on, the, on these yokel alps, as he called them, a good Icelandic term, glacial outburst floods, uh, that you have got. Uh, and, and so, but anytime you come out with a new idea, and, uh, you, you need somebody else to prove it. Well, another great geologist of the Pacific Northwest, Brian Atwater, who worked with the U.S. Geological Survey out of Seattle, was doing research in northern Washington. Uh, and uh, just west of Spokane uh, and Glacial Lake Columbia. And, and so he was drilling down, he was looking in the sections and he would see these very, very fine grain sediments, silty sediments of light, dark, light, dark light layers. And then incredible sands and gravels in between and then light, dark layers. These fine grain sediments are what we call barbs. Those are lake deposits. And so what you've got is a lake here and then you have a catastrophic flood and then lakes. And he had 89 of these lakes that were there uh, stacked up one on top of another on top of another. And so he hypothesized that there were 89 floods that were there, uh, 89 plus, because he didn't get to the bottom of the hole. And so uh, Richard Waite was very excited. And so the idea of multiple floods uh, over this period of time was wonderful. And so using the dates, as you can see here, in the old days, we use radiocarbon dates. And, but uh, we, when we calibrate them to calendar years, as you go back in time, uh, they get older and older. And so now with all of our publications, we put, convert the radiocarbon dates into real years. And so we say these uh, floods occurred between 15 and 18,000 years ago. We have some new um, uh, dates of, of exposure dates on the, some of the rocks that are exposed that go back to about 19,000, but 15, that, 18, maybe 19,000 years ago, 40 events made it to uh, Tushi and Portland, and 90 events made it to Spokane. And so we leave that today. So that is the story, and it continues on today, and it's, it's exciting as, as we geologists get together and study those. Now, uh, comparing this to other floods in the world, and so I have listed here all of the major freshwater floods in the world. And it's listed as number two. One in Altai, Russia, it is slightly bigger than that. And I'll show you that. And here is Altai, Russia. Vic Baker uh, teamed up with the Russians on this, and they calculated. He and Jim O'Connor are kind of recalculating the size of that flood, and it may uh, actually come down to be smaller than the first of the Missoula floods that we have got. Uh, and you'll notice that all of the biggest floods are all ice dam failures that you have got. Another one that is not in this one it was a, one that came out in Iceland just a few years ago. And then uh, they thought it was bigger than both of these, but then Jim recalculated those. And uh, so it's number three. So it could be the largest freshwater flood in the world uh, it was the very first of the Missoula floods, or at least close to that. It's either Altai, Russia, or here. Uh, and uh, very exciting uh, that our flood may have been the biggest. Now, the biggest floods in the world were uh, actually saltwater. Rock of Gibraltar, when that dam broke and, and, and filled up the Mediterranean area, 
uh, with water dropped the world sea level like 20 feet in just a couple of weeks. That was the biggest one then, the flood between uh, the Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea is another big one uh, that you have got. And then if you want to watch a great movie put out by the BBC called uh, Killer Floods, they talk about the Missoula floods and compare them to the floods that carved out the English Channel. Uh, and uh, Vic Baker was in, uh, involved with that, uh, but it's mostly the British that are there. So big flood. So what I want to do is the last part of the talk is to take you from up in Montana all the way to the coast and then relate it to a couple of my favorite things, wine uh, in Washington and Oregon. Uh, and so, uh, so here we are in the Ponderay Valley. Uh, it's that skinny part of Idaho that's up there. That whole valley was completely filled up with ice. Uh, and, and so you can see in this map here, there is the ice that is filling it up. And then what we do is we tell the computer to fill it in all the way back and fill in all the valleys from the melting of the glaciers. And, but you say, how do you figure out how high the dam is? Well, we go back to Missoula. And so let's go to Missoula. And so here's the University of Montana, arch enemies of Eastern Washington University uh, and Portland State University. They generally kick our butts. Of course, Eastern Washington has been kicking everybody's butt in football. Uh, and if you look up here, you can see these lines, or if we go down the valley after a snow, you can see these are the old ancient beach lines, the strand lines of Glacial Lake Missoula. You go to the hot, topest, ele highest elevation, you get that elevation, you go back, you put it in the computer, fill it in, and that's what Glacial Lake Missoula looked like. Uh, 530 cubic miles of water, 50 cubic miles of ice up here, uh, and the size of that ice dam, three space needles uh, stacked one on top of another. And it took three days. Roger Denlinger with the U.S. Geological Survey in Vancouver, Washington, did the computer model on that. And you take the dam away, and it will take three days for all of that. And it's actually half the size, if you look up here in the right-hand corner, half the size of Lake Michigan. Just outside of Missoula, there is a great section, nine miles out. That's why we call it the nine mile section. And you'll notice it is light, dark, light, dark bands. What are those? Well, the, the light bands are primarily silts and clays. This is stream deposits, back flood deposits when that area was a, uh, a river. And then the dark areas are barbs. If we look down, you could count them. We go way down to the bottom here, 58 barbs there. So that lake had lasted there. And that was Glacial Lake Missoula. Uh, and so uh, it shows, again, multiple flood hypothesis that was there. David Alt, prof great professor up at the University of Montana, studied and put that story together. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to do this next one. And I'll come back to it. So when the first flood occurred, there was a glacier coming out of the Okanagan Valley. You can see in the upper left-hand corner, and one coming out of the Chelan Valley. But there was uh, no ice in eastern Washington. So the flood waters went all over eastern Washington during that time. But then uh, what happened is the, the Okanagan load kept on growing and growing. It grew down to a point where the next five or six floods that came out hit the ice and then came down and they scoured out the Moses Cooley, maybe up to 10 floods did that. And then the ice kept on growing and it grew to a point, it lasted for a long time when the, each one of the flood waters came out, it scoured, it hit there and, and went down and scoured and scoured out the um, Grand Coulee. So the Grand Coulee and the Moses Coulee were right next to the uh, Okanagan Glacial Low. Uh, and then, so here is the Okanagan Glacial Low, but when the Columbia River was coming down, it had no place to go. It backed up and created a big lake. That was uh, Glacial Lake Columbia. So Spokane was underneath that water. And it was right here in the Sandpoil arm of that that uh, Brian Atwater found those 89 different layers of sediments that we had there. Here is the Moses Cooley, maybe five to 10 major floods came down in through this particular area. All over Eastern Washington, and you guys, you're in the heart of all of these scablands up there. You can take field trips all over. I got to come all the way up from Portland. But look at all of the scablands that are out here in eastern Washington, all carved out by those great Missoula floods. Back when Brett's was still alive, a Landsat photo, a satellite photo of eastern Washington was given to him. Here's Spokane up in the right uh, corner, Odessa, Grand Coulee over here. And he said, you know, field mapping would have been a little bit easier. Uh, if we had had the satellite images that were there. 
And one of my favorite places is the potholes area near the Quincy Basin. It was scoured out by water coming down from those great Missoula floods. All that water had to get through. Wallula Gap, as you can see here. Uh, and so this is a picture in Washington, looking up in front. That's Oregon off in the distance. And it created what we call a hydrologic dam. The water could not go through that. And so here, <clears throat> using shaded relief maps, you can see here, the water came down and it backed up and created a big lake up in the Washington as it was trying to get through that particular area. That lake went all the way up to Walla Walla, and I'll, I'll show you here. Went all the way over to uh, Prosser, Toppenish, and up to Yakima. Here is Tushi, Washington, the Walla Walla Valley, and all the way up to Othello and Moses Lake, you had just these rhythmites. And so as you're driving through that area, you see layer upon layer upon layer, those are all rhythmites of the Missoula floods. And between the 29th and 30th layer up from the bottom, that is where those, those ash layers are from Mount St. Helens S. Ash, giving us dates in that area. As the water got, went through Wallula Gap, there was another hydrologic dam as the Columbia River has a big bend in the Dalles. Uh, and as a result, it backed it up. We call it Lake Condon. Uh, that last lake here, we called it uh, Lake, uh, 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 lake uh, Lewis after Meriwether Lewis, because Lewis and Clark took good notes about all these features that they were finding. Lake Condon, named after uh, Professor Condon, the father of uh, geology in Oregon, a professor at University of Oregon. And the next picture is going to be taken right here in Arlington. Uh, and, and so this is where Portland takes its garbage up and the big dump that is here. But if we were standing up here and the Missoula floods were coming down, it would probably take one to two hours for the whole thing to fill up to what we call bank full discharge and then run continuously for two to three weeks as all of that water was coming down. The Columbia Gorge was there. And so here's the Columbia Gorge. The Columbia Gorge has been around for 15 to 20 million years. Uh, and all it did was just uh, widen it and deepen it a little bit as we went through. And so I'm going to take you down to Cascade Locks, which is right here, and I'll show you this. Uh, and then I will take you uh, to Beacon Rock, which is here, and then down to um, uh, another place just uh, further on down. So here we are at Cascade Locks. Uh, the most famous landslide in the Pacific Northwest, Bridge of the Gods landslide, or called the Bonnyfell landslide here. Uh, it was not created by the Missoula floods. All of the other low angle flood uh, uh, landslides on the whole Washington side in Washington, all created by the Missoula floods. Flood water would come in, cut off the toe, and the landslide would move down. And then another flood would come in, cut off the toe, and the landslide would continue down. This one is much younger. Uh, it happened probably around the year 1450 AD, so uh, uh, four, 560, 70 years ago. Uh, well documented. It's the most dated and the most studied landslide in the Pacific Northwest. Why? Because we built our first dam on the Columbia River right there uh, in uh, 1938. So we moved down the, the river a little bit. And right below it is Beacon Rock. It's on the Washington side. It's the heart of an old volcano. Uh, and you can see the beautiful columnar jointing. It's boring lavas. Uh, most of the other boring lavas are in the Portland, Vancouver area, all the way down to Oregon City. And this is the baby. This is the young one, only 55,000 years old. Uh, and, uh, and this was a huge volcano, and each one of the floods scoured off the rest of the way. So this is what we call a volcanic neck or a volcanic plug and so the uh, the floods have really shaped and formed this one and if you like to visit it you can climb all the way up to the top if you don't uh, mind heights and then as you come down even further um, um, uh, you, you come to rooster rock rooster rock and then here is uh, 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 up on the old the vista house which is up on the old highway going through the columbia gorge originally rooster rock was up here uh, this is one whole um, valley fill of Columbia River basalt that is here. It's the same rock here that it has here. It's big plagioclase crystals in it. After the last flood came down, uh, this landslide brought it down into this position here for uh, uh, Lewis Clark. They're meant to call it a name later on uh, as they came down.
And then from there, the water came down into the Portland, Vancouver area, coming out of the gorge at maybe 40, 50, 60 miles an hour. As it came out, it widened out. And when that does it, the velocity decreased. And look at the big, uh, huge bar. When the velocity decreases, what happens? The load, the sediments that are in it, especially gravel, come out. Uh, here in Troutdale, big, huge gravel bar that is here. But also, as the waters come out, they hit two volcanoes, Prune Hill, which is in Vancouver, uh, and then... Uh, um, and, and then also Rocky Butte, which is important. And so as it hit Prune Hill, the water would go around to this side, carved out a valley called Lacrimus Lake Valley and then Burnt Bridge Creek. And then it went this direction. But it, the area in back of it, the velocity is going to decrease and all the sediment's gonna drop out. And so you get a pendant bar, as we call it, and back of that, uh, that we call the Mill Plain Pendant Bar. And today in Vancouver, uh, incredibly gravelly and cobbly, cobbly soils that are there. In Portland, it hit Rocky Butte, scoured right in front of it. This is where I-84 and 205 uh, intersect right there. Uh, and, and, and again, it, uh, and it forms Sullivan's Gulch, which is the valley here. This is where I-84 goes through in Portland. But it formed a beautiful uh, pendant bar, which is in northern Portland. This is the highest elevation out there. I and mean, we call it Alameda Ridge, pendant bar. And then all across Portland, you get all of these bars of the gravels that are coming out uh, in back of, for instance, Mount Tabor and Kelly Butte uh, in the Hawthorne District, et cetera. And the same thing in the Vancouver area. The water, a lot of it went right through Lake Oswego, what is Lake Oswego today, carved it out. Look at the big uh, fan of sediments, and I'll show you a picture in a gravel pit right here. And then the rest of the water went through Oregon City and West Lynn and filled up the Willamette Valley. That's all. So in the Portland, Vancouver area, all of the geomorphology, the landforms are all shaped and formed by the Missoula floods. Then as it filled up the whole area, we had a lake to 400 feet elevation. Then all that water had to go back out into the ocean. And it had to go past Kalama. There was a constriction up in Kalama. And so the lake went all the way back in through there. Uh, and, and, and so the water had to come out of the valley. And, they, and it went out and through Kellogg Creek, created this right through East Portland, right through the Lucky Labrador brew pub. Geologists always use brew pubs as our geographic markers there, creating the lowland area that you have here, came out and then it had a big eddy right here on Alameda Ridge. That's what we call Swan Island. There used to be a lake on the other side called Giles Lake uh, that was filled in uh, after the uh, uh, Lewis and Clark Exposition in 1905. Then the water went out. And so each flood had water coming in and created all of these features here. Here using Photoshop and one of my grad students, Frank Ranshaw, uh, did this, and this is what Portland would have looked like as the water came in. There is Swan Island out here. This is the big eddy bar that was out there in North Portland. Now, um, just like in the Spokane area, but that down here in Portland, basalt is the bedrock that we have got, Columbia River basalt. But now and then you see these big white boulders. What is it? It's granite. We have no granite around here. How did it get here? It was ice rafted in. Uh, remember that 55 cubic miles of water? Uh, ice that made up the dam that broke up and those huge icebergs floated down and then if there were rocks and boulders on the top of it they were rafted down and then when it melted they would be deposited out. The most famous of all those ice rafted erratics we believe is the Willamette meteorite. Where was it found? Just south of Portland outside of West Lynn at 400 feet elevation. One of the first floods it probably fell uh, up in Canada onto the ice and then was ice rafted down. Uh, uh, Dick Pugh, an uh, uh, adjunct member in our department who just recently passed away, went out to the place where this was found. There should, something this big should have created the big crater. No crater. But there were lots of gravel, gravel pieces around there of granite and uh, argillite and other rocks that are not found here. So we believe that it was ice rafted in. Uh, and then as uh, this is Lake Oswego here, uh, as the water is filling up the Tuolumne Valley, I'm going to take you out here and then right here and show you what that fan looked like. Look at all of these four set beds as the water is coming from right to left, forming all of these. I used to take my students to this quarry to show pictures of them, of the great Missoula floods coming through there. And just out, just only a couple miles away, you would find rhythm lights. Now, gravel, sand, silt. Gravel, sand, silt, gravel, sand, silt. These are rhythmites, but these are rhythmites that were formed in high velocity zones instead of the slack water deposits of valleys 
uh, for instance, that you would get up in the Tushi uh, area, in the Yakima area, in the Prosser area. Uh, and then after each one of the floods, there would be huge amounts of silt out in the floodplains. Well, in Portland, we get huge winds in the wintertime that blow uh, through Portland and from east to west as you get the high pressure areas in eastern Washington. Uh, and it, blow, it would blow, blow a lot of that silt up into the trees of Portland. And we have up to 150 feet thick of Portland Hill silt. Where did it originate from? The Palouse country, it's Palouse that was brought down by the floods and then reblown up there. And so we have lots of, here's a paleosol right here, down at the bottom. This is the last 18,000 uh, 18, years, and this is the old paleosol that was there before. And so here's the map of Portland. The water comes through, fills up the Tualat Valley, which is right out in this area. And then that water has got to come back into it as the flood waters decrease, going down through Gaston and into the Lamont River, through the Tonkin Scablands in Tualatin and Sherwood, also through Tualatin here, and then maybe some of it went through Lake Oswego, and then the water would go back out into the oceans. Uh, so here's a map on the right-hand side done by Ira Allison in 1935 of these Ice Age uh, rafted um, um, uh, glacial erratics, uh, uh, ice rafted erratics. And, and what he did, when you go to the highest elevations and they're about 400 feet elevation. And so that meant that the lake got up to 400 feet and then some of them are down to much lower ones. And so we, here is the Willamette Valley, two 400 feet elevation, and we call it Lake Allison after Ira Allison. I'll show you another ice raft and erratic, erratic here in McMinnville. Uh, and then I'll go down to Corvallis for another photo in just a second. So the most famous erratic you can visit today as you're going to the coast down to Lincoln City, there's a big sign that says glacial erratic there. It, it's argillite. Argillite is a metamorphic rock. There's none down here. It came from up in Montana. Ice raft at 400 feet elevation. And there are a lot, this is hard of wine country down here. Uh, and then as you get down just south of Corvallis, you can see the old paleosol, the soil that was here as the valley filled up. And these are all rhythmites that are found from here to here, 40 of them uh, that can be counted there. After each flood, the water would go through Kalama and then out into the ocean. Remember, the ocean was 300 feet lower at that particular time than it is today. Uh, and, and so we had a big canyon there. And then afterwards, as sea level rose to where it is today, 5,000 years ago, it would fill in with sediments. Uh, Dr. Normark, an uh, oceanographer, has followed the marine or the sediments out there on the Astoria fan and on the back of the Gordon Ridge, the Tufts fan. And we have Missoula flood sediments all the way down to the Mendocino Fault. That is where the San Andreas Fault go out, goes out into the ocean. Uh, and he, he said there are 700 cubic kilometers of sediment out there that came from these different floods. Now, that's the story of the Missoula floods. But we also have remnants. Uh, this is in the Dalles. And here, here's the Dalles down here. This is Oregon side, Washington over here. And you have modern Missoula floods, 15 to 18,000 years old. But look at all of these paleosols that are in here. We've worked this up and we find five major uh, uh, floods from the past. We call those ancient cataclysmic floods. Those are floods from the past that uh, uh, were here. We go up to um, Othello and just outside of Othello, here are flood, uh, flood sediments here with an, uh, a K horizon, Caliche horizon on top. This took thousands and thousands of years to form. And so this is an old, one of these ancient cataclysmic floods. Here's Erica Medley. She did her a master's degree underneath this on 30 different sites in Washington where you can find these old floods. And Cap Barnard, one of my PhD students over here, helping us. You go, to, here's the Yakima River. Look up here, there are, uh, there are gravels that are up here that are cemented together with caliche and underneath it, you get rhythmites. And so anytime you have caliche here, this is at least 30 to 40 to 50,000 year old soil that is formed here. And you look at the sediments underneath, here's Erica, and look at the light lines. There are 14 different rhythmites that are here with a 50 to 100,000 year old deposit on top of it. So these are ancient cataclysmic floods. So we believe that these ancient cataclysmic floods, and together we call the Missoula floods and the ancient cataclysmic floods, the ice age floods, have occurred for the last 2.8 million years across Oregon and Washington. Now, there is a relationship between the Missoula floods and, and uh, grapes and wine. 
In the United States, what is the number one state for the making of wine in the United States? California. Who's number two? Washington. Uh, and the number of wineries in volume coming out. Who's number three? Oregon. So here in the Northwest, it's effective. And the Missoula floods um, uh, are part of the story. Here is the heart of Dundee Hills. Red soils, look at that. That's the Jory soil, our state soil. Missoula floods down here. In Oregon, in the Willamette Valley, where we don't irrigate uh, the, the vines, what we have to do is to reduce the vigor because you don't want to have vigorous uh, soils that are there. What you do is you use old soil. So the older, the redder the soil, the older it is, the more well-drained it is, and the lower nutrients. So we grow all of our grapes on the red soils above the Missoula flood center. Here is up in Yakima. There's a nice red sediment, boulder that is there. These are all Missoula flood sediments down here. All of those vineyards are being grown on Missoula flood sediments. You said, and, and why do we stay off of them in Oregon? Because they're too nutrient rich. They grow leaves and stems and leaves and stems, and they don't put the energy into the grapes. You say, well, wait a second, how about Washington? Washington has to irrigate everything because it's so dry in eastern Washington. And so therefore, you limit the vigor by giving just enough water to keep the plants alive. Uh, and so you can grow on nutrient-rich soil. So in Washington, 95% of the vineyards are on Missoula flood sediments, and the vigor is controlled by irrigation. Whereas in Oregon, 90 in the Willamette Valley, 90% of the vineyards are on the upland area, and 10% are on the Missoula flood sediments. Bigger is controlled by low nutrient old soils. Why do we rewrite the book? Because our latest, one of our latest uh, national parks is the Ice Age uh, Geologic Flood Trail. Uh, it goes from uh, Astoria, Nilwaco, all the way up to Missoula. And we will have 15 or so visitor centers along the way, with the heart being at Dry Falls uh, in the Grand Coulee. Uh, talking about this geological event, and we wanted to have a book that would talk about the story of J. Harlan Bretz and then all of these different parts. And so that's why uh, I rewrote the book that we had. So if you fell asleep, it's time to get up. Uh, and so what did I talk about? We had 89 floods, 40 of them got to uh, Malula and to Portland. Velocities up to 60 miles an hour. If you look at the flows, that is in cubic meters per second, if you take all of the rivers of the world, add up all those flows, multiply by 10, that is uh, the flow in cubic meters per second, in millions of cubic meters per second, of the Missoula floods. Mind-boggling. In modern history, we have never seen anything like this. It affected 16,000 square miles in the Pacific Northwest. And as we mentioned, the maximum flood was 530 uh, cubic miles of water that you had. And the age of the Missoula floods, 15 to 18,000 calendar years ago. Ancient cataclysmic floods throughout the whole uh, last quaternary or 2.8 million years. Uh, and so the Ice Age floods, that's why we use that as the general term, are the Missoula floods and the ancient cataclysmic floods. Always a question that comes up, were humans around? And yes, we probably think so. The oldest uh, arche uh, archeological site in the United States of the Paisley Caves in Oregon, 14,500 calendar years ago. Uh, we believe that humans were here. Where would they have been? They would have been following the rivers, following the fish. Uh, and so many of them were wiped out at that particular time as the, they came through. So that is the story. Uh, I love talking about it, of how science worked and didn't work, and the stories of J. Harlan Bretz and all of the uh, people since that time. Uh, and then also um, uh, the whole story of the Ice Age floods. For you in, um, uh, in the Spokane area, Bruce Bjornstad, a good friend of mine who's written books, he wrote, he and Gene Kiever wrote a book a couple of years ago uh, called uh, On the, the Trail of Ice Age Floods, The Northern Reaches. Came out in 2012. Absolutely the best book for studying the Missoula floods in your area up there. Also, Bruce came out with a new book. It's called uh, Ice Age Floodscapes. He's got a drone and he's going all over the Missoula Floods area in Washington and taking pictures of this. And if you are a, a flood junkie, that I put a little plug in for him. Great friend, great researcher, and uh, just a wonderful guy. Chad, thank you to you and Meg for inviting me to be talking tonight. And with that, what I'm going to do is say thank you. And I wrote, if there are any questions that are out there. Well, no, thank you, Scott. That was great. 
Um, so it looks like Nigel might answer some. We had uh, one question by Lloyd here. Um, you stated the ice dam broke apart after water began to breach it. I've always been told a dam failed before water breached it. Yes, and uh, so the front of a glacier is, is riddled with lots of, of caves and holes in, that are in that. And uh, I've got pictures of being in the fronts of glaciers. And, uh, and, and so um, it, for many, many years, a lot of us thought uh, it was, uh, what happened is the water in back of it flowed the, the, the ice up and it started going underneath and then it broke up. But then the civil engineers, who were studying it and mathematically looked into this said, eh, not a good idea. And, and so we really don't get into saying how it broke up, but it broke up. And when it, but uh, the front is not very strong in any glacier because of all of the different channels and floods, uh, holes that are in it. And once it starts breaking up and water starts making us through, it just breaks up and completely, um, uh, uh, liberates the water in back of it. So that's why I just say it broke up and we leave it at that. Fair enough for that, yeah. Um, so if people do have questions, you can go down to participants there, um, click on that and then click raise your hands. While I'm looking for more raised hands, um, Scott, what do you have against basalt? I heard you call the basalt boring. Oh, yeah. Hey. Gorge. Well, hey, there is nothing in, uh, no, uh, there is nothing boring about anything in geology. And I, I don't have to tell you, Chad or Meg, about this. Uh, it, it is absolutely wonderful. Uh, but it was first described in Boring, Oregon. Now, once I, I, I took a girl out on a date once from Boring, Oregon, and I'll tell you, she was very befitting of the town that she was from. Uh, it was the first date, the last date, that was it. So some things in life can be boring, but not geology. I like it. There is a hand up. Jenny Thompson. Jenny. Jenny, where? How do I unmute you? Sorry, one second. Participants, how do I unmute you? Nigel. Oh, Nigel, you have to unmute Jenny. I've got could. it. I've got okay. it. I think she's gone. Oh no. Yeah. Uh, but we have a question about uh, anybody trying to trace the erratics back to their original points of origin for you, Scott. Yes, and, um, and they, have, they have done that. For instance, that argillite that I showed you, the only place you really have argillite is going to be up in Montana. Uh, and then those are the belt rocks uh, that you have got. Granite is a little more difficult. Uh, because uh, they're, they're all, there's granite, granite diorite, uh, uh, all different types of intrusives, and uh, they can be very, very close to one another. So it is not as easy, but if you have the sedimentary types of rocks, uh, uh, they've done some of that. Uh, so yes, they've tried, it is, it's not very definitive. So another question from Rick Orndorff. Uh, uh, are there any, uh, any evidence for much earlier versions of Lake Missoula uh, from drill cores that fed the ancient cataclys cataclysmic floods? I mean, so, uh, so we have, as I mentioned, we have these 30 sites uh, uh, that are found all over Washington and some in Oregon. And uh, uh, that one, we have one site in the Willamette Valley and one up in the Dalles. So those are sites that are well established and we like them very much. Also, uh, Normark out on the Astoria fan and some of the drill cores out there, sediments has found some of those too. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's a little harder to differentiate uh, the, the older ones from the younger ones. Now, we have a site just outside of Corvallis uh, and the granite is, uh, there's a piece of granite that is completely weathered, it's grouse. And so it has been down here for uh, maybe a million years and been weathering down here to that. Uh, if it had come down in the 15 to 18,000 year old events, it would not have uh, done that. And so this was a, a good example for us of these ancient cataclysmic floods. Okay. Uh, I think I got Jenny. Can, Jenny, can you talk? Uh, Scott. 
Your talk was excellent. I just wanted to send my biggest hugs to you. And big hugs back. Jenny and I go back years and years. Way, a long time ago. Just wanted to say thank you for presenting to our university. A fantastic talk and I love you. Same back to you. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> we have lots of stories I could tell about Jenny, but not Nick. We don't oh, no, have no, to no, 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 no. All right. <laughs> I've got a couple of questions uh, here from Amy Kiefer. Uh, was the ice dam thick enough to have influenced the development of the west shore of Lake Pend Oreille? And, and, and that is an answer I don't know. Uh, we, are, we are going to be having a Friends of the Pleistocene trip up to Pend the Pend Oreille Valley coming up once COVID is over. It was supposed to have been this fall. So it'll be probably next year. And we will be studying that whole area. And uh, if any of you are interested, uh, Friends of the Pleistocene is a low budget, go, get out in the field, camp for two or three days, go and see a whole bunch of neat uh, quaternary geology types of things and uh, drink a wee bit of beer or wine at nighttime. And, uh, but uh, it's a great way to discuss these things. And we will be up in that area and. So I don't have an answer now, but we will maybe a year from now. All right, another fun question regarding the Snake River. How far did the backwater flooding go back up the snake? Oh, oh, I, I, I love it. And, um, and, and so if you go to, uh, um, to Eastern Washington, where the snake comes in, uh, uh, what's the name of the town? Uh, what, uh, Lewiston and Clarkston. Lewiston and Clarkston. Uh, and uh, you, can, uh, you can see uh, interaction of the Missoula floods. The Missoula floods are flat, flat, flat. And then you had the Bonneville floods, which uh, so there was a large super flood that came out of Lake Bonneville, which is the, uh, where the Great Salt Lake is today. Uh, it was what we call a pluvial lake that filled up a good portion of Utah went over the, the pass going down into Idaho, and it, the water came down, the Snake River floodplain through, uh, 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 through the Snake River and into the Columbia, but it went through uh, Lewiston and Clarkston, and you can see these four set beds of the Bonneville floods up there on top of the flat line Missoula floods, and then Missoula flood beds on top of it. Uh, and so, uh, the water eventually got into the Columbia River. By the time it got to Portland, the, the vol volume of the water had been dissipated, so it wasn't very big for most of the gorge. But uh, up until that point, it had significant amount of erosion and deposition. And you can see those tilted four-set beds if you go over to Lewiston. It's actually in Clarkston. I think that uh, there's a gravel quarry that is there. It's just marvelous. I normally, if I had more time, I would have shown that. Oh, that's, that's great. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, Dave Enos uh, asks, uh, any efforts to date the steepened slope relative to the CSZ quakes? The CSC quakes. Cascadia subduction zone. Sub oh, Cascadia yes. subduction oh, zone oh, quakes. Oh, it, 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 yes. yes, 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 yes. And, and in fact, uh, I'm involved in landslides, and so all up and down the, uh, the Pacific Northwest coast, any big landslide, we have so many of these very, very large uh, slides, some reactivated and, and some actually caused by them. And so we have been looking for uh, examples of those and getting dates. Uh, it's hard to find datable materials or, or the buried soils uh, or uh, logs or things like that. Uh, and so, so far we don't have, there, there are a couple places in the Oregon coast range where we think we have got uh, some uh, 300 and some uh, 800 year old landslides. Uh, but there's uh, a lot of uh, researchers are looking at that right now to try and see if we can get a whole bunch of them. Is it, uh, we, we're looking for them. <coughs> All right. 
So next fun question was, uh, what's for you? What's up for you next, Scott? Uh, besides wine country? Well, there are lots of things. I mean, I, I give talks on radon too, and then in fact, in Spokane, you guys have got a wee bit of radon. Down here, we have mostly basalt. Basalt should not be a radon generator, and as a result, uh, uh, but where we have Missoula flood sediments, we've got all those feldspars from in the sands, and we have huge amounts of radon. And radon is easily detected in homes and it's easily mitigated. And so everybody in Spokane should be testing their houses. It's cheap to test, it's cheap to mitigate because we don't, 20% uh, 20, uh, 20 of uh, all uh, lung cancer deaths are coming from radon. And we don't, we understand the geology now. We don't want people to do that. So I work with that. Uh, I also work with landslides uh, and I continue to do. Uh, wine, terroir, too. And uh, that's a never-ending battle, but wonderful to work with. And so, and uh, the other thing is, I, I teach one course a year at Portland State uh, at Geology of the National Parks. And our national parks are phenomenal in the Northwest. We've got all these great national parks. And so I enjoy that, too. Speaking of wine, Chad, this might be a really good time to plug um, another event that we have coming up. Yeah, just real quick, I'd like to say thank you again to Scott Burns. We'd probably answer a couple more questions again later. As always, amazing. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, our next talk for sort of a Columbia Basin style talk is going to be with the EW Alumni Association. They're starting a new wine club called Eagle Flights. Um, so Dr. Eric Abbey, a chemistry professor at Eastern, and then I'll talk about um, some geology of wines from that Washington Rocks book that we wrote. Um, Eric and I did that at Mobius for a, a nerd night and he, Eric's got this great pH experiment where he can kind of tweak with wines a lot just by changing the, the, the pH. So it's kind of, should be a good time. And we'll probably have a couple of bottles of Cab and, and Chardonnay and we expect people to do the same so we can have some tasting and think about malolactic fermentation. Um, that'll be on the 17th and you can find these, in, these uh, webinars now, I guess, on our social media sites. The next one's on uh, September 29th as well, another Zoom meeting and that'll be Tom Broker not Tom Brokaw, but Dr. Tom Broker, USGS geologist, one of my, some of my favorite papers on paleo seismology and current seismology. Um, he knows, he's going to talk a little bit about the, the rotation of the whole Pacific Northwest and then also the second largest earthquake in Washington at the NTAC, um, sort of the largest historic after the Cascadia subduction zone. Um, and we have a whole bunch more talks coming on. We'll post those around and hopefully we'll get Scott to come back again, especially if Zoom's an option. Um, they all should be pretty fun talks. I don't know if we can all beat Scott and his excitement towards geology, but but yeah, we'll have fun. Um, keep in mind, all these talks are free because the wonderful generosity of the speakers, just like like Scott, thank you very much. Um, and if you wouldn't mind, just consider donating to a geology department near you. I know I've donated to the Scott Burns Scholarship at Portland State. Um, and Eastern also has, an, has a research fund for students just because it's such a rough time right now. And I would like to thank uh, Bill and Marianne Capal and Gary Hammond for their already generous do donations. Um, so yeah, if there's a couple more questions, we can do those, Nigel. But I just wanted to sort of say thanks. I saw the numbers start to go down. Yeah. And thank you again, Scott. Well, speaking of Bill Capal, um, he asked a question uh, just now. So uh, do, you, uh, do you have the oldest age for the ancient cataclysmic flood events? So, uh, so it, it is very, very difficult to get real accurate dates back then. But we have some dates that probably one million, oh, definitely over uh, 600,000 years old. Uh, because the, the section that we have in the, uh, uh, up in the uh, Columbia Gorge, just outside of the Dalles, uh, we have got... Um, uh, uh, the Dybiki Waylay Tuff, which has been dated as 600,000 years above the, the lowest uh, flood event. And so at least back to 600,000, but I think some of the ones that are up in, in near Othello, we may get over a million years old. So we could do that. Maybe one, one last question, uh, uh, indicating, do, do we see any evidence that mammoths or uh, mammals were uh, caught up into these floods um, and with the human overlap 
uh, timing wise with the floods? And, and the answer is yes. Uh, Gary over in the Tri-Cities, I think they have a mammoth uh, site that they have actually excavated in the Missoula flood sediments. Uh, and they are uh, gonna be putting that together. He, us down in Tualatin, Oregon, we have a mastodon. Uh, and in fact, the Macedon is now mounted in our library, and that will be the major thing of our visitor center down here for the Ice Age floods. Um, of, and we will have a whole section on Ice Age mammals, uh, uh, of all of the different mammals that were found uh, during the time of these flood events. And so, yes, they definitely were around there. Oh, one one last one last question from Chris. I'm trying zooming back to that question. So uh, you stated that the glacial lake Missoula drained in about three days with the backwater lakes along the way. How long did the actual flood last down the length of the Columbia River? So how long was that flooding? All right, the um, we still don't have any uh, really really good. Uh, information on that because the computer keeps breaking down because I mean when you get all these variables of topography when you put all of them in uh, <coughs> Roger Denlinger is still his lifelong ambition is to say how long did it take to for all of that water to get down to Portland the last in Portland to go out into the ocean etc uh, but Vic Baker's latest PhD student dealt with this and I haven't read the dissertation and he I think he he's got velocities along the way but I don't know, and I think he's got time. Uh, and so I think some of it might be in that. And so I need to uh, read that thesis or dissertation uh, and then put it all together. So I think we're very, very close to uh, getting the answers to that. Uh, Nigel, thank you very much for your help tonight and shepherding all of this through. Keep up the good job of working and teaching there at Eastern Washington. Uh, and thanks to everybody who was on tonight. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk about this. Uh, um, I could always, if you guys want to learn about geology in other parts of, of Washington, I, I did a recent talk, um, uh, Science Pub here in Portland, 5,000 people watched the night, and that was geology, the dynamic geology of the Columbia Gorge, which is shared by our two states, and it's kind of fun. I also have another one on the geology of the Pacific Northwest, uh, um, uh, national parks. And which is always lots of fun too. So Nigel, thank you uh, for your help. Uh, and uh, also Chad, Meg, and the boys, thank you. And uh, I, one of my favorite uh, things is uh, Chad blowing up a volcano in the garbage can. And you probably have all seen that. If you haven't, then maybe you gotta do it in one of the future things. So thank you very much to all of you for the invitation tonight. Thank you, Scott. You have a wonderful evening, sir. I hope you enjoy a glass of wine here. I am. <laughs> All right. All right. I think with thank that, we'll, we'll call it a good evening, and thank you very much for attending. All right. I think you're the host, Nigel. All right. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to cancel this out, so have a great day, and uh, see you guys all soon, virtually. Right. Cheers, gang. Thanks,